Good morning, everybody. This is Stephanie with Generations Health Education. Thanks so much for joining us for our webinar this morning, Preventing Exploitations, Considerations for Protecting Your Loved One During the Healthcare Crisis. We are so lucky to have Brightview Senior Living Communities of Montgomery County sponsoring this event. We'll be hearing from them in a little bit. Before we get started, just a couple of things to cover. First, everyone is muted to eliminate any background noise. However, this is an interactive program, so if you have any questions, comments, or answers to questions, feel free to type into the chat box. If you're not familiar with Zoom, to find chat, just scroll over the bottom of your screen and a little banner pops up. You'll see a little bubble that says chat. If you click on that, it will launch the chat feature on the right-hand side of your screen. Okay, I'd like to ask our sponsors to share a little bit of information. Please welcome Heather from Brightview West End to give a little bit of information. Unmute. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today um, for our webinar by Generations Health Education. I'm Heather and I'm the Community Sales Director here at Brightview West End, along with Jana Stevenson actually going to share a, my screen with you. So I am here at Brightview West End located in downtown Rockville. We offer independent living assisted living, gallery, Wellspring Village, which is our memory care community, and our enhanced care community. Our Montgomery County locations, um, we actually have four of those. We have Brightview Woodmont, which is an urban community located in Bethesda, which offers assisted living and memory care. We have Brightview Falls Grove, which is a suburban community located in Rockville, which offers assisted living and memory care. We have Brightview Woodmont, which is an urban community located in Bethesda, which offers assisted living and memory care. We have availability of all four of our Montgomery County locations, if you, um, and if you aren't sure which one of these locations will work best for you, we will help you decide and direct you in the right direction. We're happy to be here today with Jennifer and Stephanie. Thank you. Thanks so much, Heather. I appreciate that. And thank you again to Brightview of Montgomery County Communities uh, for sponsoring today's program. Okay, let's go ahead and give you a little bit of background information about our presenter today. Today's presenter is the author of Cruising Through Caregiving, Reducing the Stress of Caring for Your Loved One, and a longtime gerontology instructor at Johns Hopkins University's Certificate on Aging program. She is one of less than 800 certified speaking professionals worldwide and has been featured in national media such as the Wall Street Journal, Reader's Digest, U.S. News and World Report, CBS, ABC, and many more. When she's not working, she spends her time fantasizing about when she will be able to wander the aisles of TJ Maxx and Marshalls without a mask. Please join me in welcoming from Kent Island, Maryland, Jennifer L. Fitzpatrick, MSW, LCSWC. Hi, everybody, and welcome. It's great to be here with you today. Uh, if you've never been to a Brightview Generations Partnered Program on virtual, we are so glad that you decided to come. Hopefully someday soon we'll be doing these again in person. But feel free, we try to run this as interactively as possible. As Stephanie said, write in your comments, write in your questions. We're actually going to have a poll in a few minutes to just gauge a little bit of your feedback. So we look forward to uh, to ha hearing your comments and your questions. This is all about you and helping you to prevent exploitation for your loved one during this healthcare crisis. So as I said, we're gonna start out with a question about scams. We're always hearing about scams in the media. We hear them about from friends and family, but if you or somebody you know has been scammed before, uh, we want you to write into the poll section. So Stephanie, if you would pull up the first poll, 
and just let us know, have you ever experienced being scammed or did you have a loved one? And you don't have to share any more than that unless you want to, but if you would like to share that, that would be great. Hi, actually, this is Stephanie. Um, the poll is for the next slide over. I didn't have one for this one. So if the folks could, could write into the, to the chat box, that'd be great. Oh, sure, if you want to just write in yes or no, and if you feel like sharing any details, you're very welcome to do that. And while everybody's doing that, it's, I think it's really important to know that most people, either they themselves have been scammed or they know somebody that has been scammed. So please keep in mind that this scams happen to people who are super smart, super educated. They, they happen to people who don't have as much education. They happen to people at all economic levels. So there is no shame in having experienced a scam. Today we're gonna to talk about scams, but we're also gonna talk about when there is exploitation by somebody that we actually know, which in some ways can even be harder. So now we're going to talk, I'm doing one more poll. Uh, I know we, uh, we said we were gonna do one before, but Stephanie's gonna pull up. What de best describes your loved one during the pandemic and social distancing? So, and if you are a resident or a prospective resident of a Brightview Senior Living community, maybe it's you, but if you're talking about a, a loved one, a spouse or a parent that you're, you're helping to take care of, perhaps um, just let us know what does best describes your loved one. Is it that your loved one is out and about doing normal activities, seeing people in person regularly? Is it that they talk on the phone a lot and they answer regardless of caller ID? Is it that your loved one stays in touch with by phone and computer? Uh, all of the above or none of the above apply to your loved one. So just let us know. So we'll give everybody a few moments to click on what answer best applies to themselves or their loved one situation. So let's see if we get those results. Okay, so uh, nobody said their loved one is out and about. And nobody's loved one is out and about doing normal activities and seeing family and friends in person. Okay, so that's, that's very important to know for this program. About a third of you are saying your loved one talks on the phone and will answer regardless of the caller ID. About a third of you also said that your loved one stays in touch with others by phone and computer, maybe on Zoom, maybe on social media. And then uh, about third of you said none of this applies to your loved one. So thank you for sharing that. So uh, it, um, it really helps me to know from our audience, it sounds like nobody's loved one is out and about seeing friends and family in person regularly because of social distancing. Now, I know some of you might make the assumption that everybody who is an older adult right now is social distancing, but that's actually not true. Not everybody is, uh, is doing that. So that, that's why we wanted to ask that question. So thank you all for, for sharing your experiences. There are so many different types of elder mistreatment that can occur, and everybody's probably heard of the horror stories of people being physically harmed, emotionally, sexually, people neglecting themselves, family members, or communities neglecting uh, persons who are older adults. But financial exploitation is falls into this elder mistreatment category. Financial exploitation is an enormous problem. According to AARP, 20% uh, of all older adults are financially exploited at one point or another, but only one out of 44 are reported. So you can only imagine how many stories you've heard. Think about the stories that you've heard. Someone's told you about a friend, a neighbor, maybe a family member, or maybe it's happened to you or your loved one. That's only a tip of the iceberg of the financial exploitation that's actually happening day in and day out. 
what qualifies as exploitation? So clearly somebody, maybe you leave your purse out all on your, your, on your car in the front seat and maybe you run back into your house to get something and somebody steals your purse can qualify officially as elder exploitation according to the National Association of Adult Protective Services. It also might involve a Ponzi scheme or somebody forging your financial information on un unauthorized checks. So a Ponzi scheme, like the probably the most famous one we've all known about is the Bernie Madoff story. And if you're not familiar with the Bernie Madoff story, I know probably many of you are, this scam hit hard, lots of rich, lots of smart people, celebrities even. Uh, Kevin Bacon, the actor, and his wife, Kira Sedgwick, have talked really openly about how they were scammed by Bernie Madoff. If you haven't watched, there's, there was two movies that were really, really good um, about uh, Wizard of Lies, I believe, was one of them. One of the movies had Richard Dreyfuss play, play, uh, play uh, Bernie Madoff, and one of them actually had Robert De Niro, and they were both really good. Uh, but if you want to learn a little bit more about Ponzi schemes in that case, that those would be some movies to check out. So unauthorized real estate transactions. So I remember when my my husband's grandma was sick, her son went and sold some of her real estate without her knowing about it. And was this legal? No, but this happened. And actually, there wasn't a whole lot that we could do about it. It was done without her permission, but there was an unauthorized real estate transaction that occurred, uh, allegedly. And so this was uh, something that can absolutely be considered exploitation as well. So exploitation can take many, many types of forms. It can happen by somebody you know really well. It can happen by somebody that you're working with that you think is a trusted professional. It also can happen, of course, by strangers. So contractual work paid for, but not completed. So uh, yesterday I actually had a contractor come to my house to make an estimate on something. And I said, do you want a deposit? And he actually did the opposite of this. He said, oh no, we've worked together a long time. I don't need a deposit from you. Uh, but you may recall there was a, a really interesting podcast a couple of years ago called Dirty John. And it was about a story about a woman named Deborah Newell who uh, got conned by a man named John Meehan. And I highly recommend the podcast. And I also recommend the Bravo miniseries starring Connie Britton. It's a very interesting story. But the reason that, that I bring up the contractual work uh, uh, paid for but not completed, uh, that this man, Dirty John or John Meehan, he had done some conning of the a wife, his wife, Deborah Newell. But when he was a young person, when people look back into his past, one of the things that he bragged about as a young adult was that he would go around and go to older adults' homes and say, oh, well, I'll cut down that tree for you. I'm going to mow the lawn. And he'll take a deposit and never come back, never do the work. And so this is another form of exploitation that does often, is targeted often at older persons. Lottery scams. There's lottery tickets. There's but there's no prize. No one ever gets drawn. That that uh, maybe a 50-50 lottery. There's there's a lot of these that happen. Phone and email phishing. You probably all experienced this at one point or another. Your loved one picks up the phone and somebody says that they are calling from a charity, and sometimes they are calling from a charity, but sometimes they're not. There's a lot of very, and there can be software that scrambles phone numbers, makes it look like the phone is the phone number is coming from a charity. So it can be really tricky. We've probably all got the email from the so-called uh, Nigerian prince who wants to leave money to you. And many of us have received that. I know as a professional speaker, I am on a Facebook page with a lot of other speakers and I will say almost daily, somebody writes in uh, on the Facebook page, the private Facebook page, and says, oh, I got this email about paying me some extraordinary amount of money to fly overseas and do a speaking engagement. And a lot of that is scams. And what it often involves is you have to pay a fee for your visa, and then we refund you money, and it's all just to get a hold of your credit card. Or worse, 
to have the money wired, which then the money's really gone. And the reason that I wanted to bring up what happens with myself on that speaker page is because this is some really, really, really smart and talented, educated people, doctors, lawyers, accountants, people that are, uh, they're, they're thought leaders in their area of expertise in, in all kinds of different industries. And every day almost in our private Facebook page for the National Speakers Association, somebody is writing in about something that a lot of us say, well, yeah, that looks like a scam, but a lot of people aren't sure. They don't want to miss an opportunity. And so think about it. A lot of our older adults before the pandemic, your loved ones, they might be lonely. They might not have seen a lot of people. They might not have had a lot of company. Now, because all of you have said your loved one is social distancing, they're not seeing friends and family in person very often, they're probably even more at risk for a communication that might come through phone or email. Products that are inappropriate financial products, insurance products. Years ago, I remember my grandmother went into her bank, and this is in the late 2000s, when uh, the stock market crashed, and she had lost a lot of money, and she was had capacity, totally confident, but she was angry about it, and she pretty much told everybody she knew how frustrated she was. And my grandma was a very pleasant, wonderful person, but I remember during that time period, it was really tough. She was really angry for losing a lot of money in the stock market. And she was in some really conservative products, but it just everything just went wild at that time, if you recall. And I remember my grandmother calling me and telling me the story that she went into her bank and that she was talking to them about how she lost all this money. And what wound up happening was she, at the bank, the bank teller says, well, you know, maybe make an appointment with one of our staff here. And he, this gentleman can help you maybe try to recoup some of that money. And what wound up happening was um, my grandmother got put into a product on that day that she was not gonna be able to access her money without a major penalty for seven years. Now, my grandmother put the bulk of her money into this product. And she calls and she's really proud of herself and she's so excited that she did this and she feels like she took some ownership of after having lost so much money in the stock market. And I told my husband about it because my husband works in the financial field and of course, I told my dad about it because my dad had worked in the financial field and they, they thought there were a lot of red flags. And thankfully, there is a 30 day period where for this product, my grandmother could get out of it. But the the important thing to keep in mind about this is if the product itself wasn't a bad product it's just that my grandmother at the time was 85 and a half and she put the vast majority of her assets into this product if she removed those assets that she would have major major penalties lose a lot of her money now for seven years let's say at 85 oh sorry i'm sorry she was 80 she was 80 years old when this happened Let's say she gets to 87, she might have gotten some really nice returns. But we know at 80, she's already beat the average lifespan. To tie up all of her money for that long really could have had a major impact on her life, her, her quality of life. And think about it, if, if for some reason she needed to go to assisted living or if she ever needed to apply for medical assistance or she, you know, there were so many reasons this product was inappropriate. Nothing wrong with the product, maybe for somebody younger, or maybe an 80-year-old who had a lot more money than my grandmother. But my grandmother actually did die at 85 and a half, and she would have never seen that money if she didn't get out of that product. I believe that that was an exploitive measure taken by that bank employee. Now, the argument that I'm going to make to you is, some people might say, well, maybe that bank employee just didn't understand. That's possible, but their job is to understand that that's not a, an appropriate suggestion for somebody like my grandma. But on the other hand, a lot of people would say, yeah, that definitely looks like intentional financial exploitation because perhaps this gentleman did this strictly for the commission. So this can be considered inappropriate products or it wasn't a Ponzi scheme, but it might have, it was, it was an inappropriate product for where my grandmother was, what her assets were, and what her age was. Feel free to write in any comments or questions if you have any thoughts on what we're talking about. 
Um, we've all seen this one, IRS calling in, I need to change your tax, tax return, we need your credit card, we need you to send wire money today. The IRS is not gonna make a demand like that, but those sorts of things happen quite frequently. So how do we wanna protect our older loved ones and ourselves? We wanna understand who's most at risk, who is most risky, who is most likely to exploit somebody, we want to involve our loved one in preventing this from happening to themselves. We don't want our biases to get in the way. We want to know resources. We want to document what we're doing and don't make decisions in a vacuum. So the first one is we want to know who is most at risk. So like I said, anybody is at risk for financial exploitation. Kevin Bacon and Kira Sedgwick were exploited smart, educated people, but people less educated. Rich people are exploited. People who are less fortunate are exploited. But who really has the qualities and characteristics that are most risky? So I want you to be thinking about your loved one and thinking what qualities and characteristics does he or she have that may render him or her more at risk or less at risk. So take a piece of paper and a pen and, and feel free to write. Uh, somebody who has poor physical health. And that can mean any number of things, that they're struggling to take care of themselves, that they're in and out of the hospital. Only you can, you know, if, you, if, if we're looking at a scale of one being horrible, poor health, 10 being ideal health, if that person's below what you would consider a five, I would say that they're in that category. Declining cognitive health is definitely an issue. So, Let's talk for a moment, uh, do a quick poll as we continue our conversation, and who do you believe is most at risk? So Stephanie would pull up this poll. Who's most at risk? An individual, so who's most at risk for financial exploitation? An individual with three children, an individual who does not have children, or you don't have any idea. So let us know what you think. So I'll give you all a moment, Stephanie, I'll tally those polls up for us. Wow, this is actually very interesting. Very, very interesting indeed. And I, you guys are very savvy because uh, you're saying an individual who has three kids would be most at risk. I appreciate so much that the group that we have understands that you can be exploited financially by your own children, but actually the data suggests that an individual who does not have kids is going to be more likely to be financially exploited. We, But I do appreciate how savvy you are to have that awareness that an adult child can certainly exploit, but actually the data says those who don't have kids are much more at risk for financial exploitation. For investment uh, scams, more likely than the general population, it's people that are married, old men who are married that have some college degree and their uh, income, annual income is 50,000 or more. Who's less at risk if you have a robust social network? So I'll give you myself as an example. My husband and I don't have any children. So we would, if, according to Stanford, we would be into this category that we'd probably be more at risk as we age for financial exploitation. But we do have a very robust social network. That, so I think that that's really important as we get older uh, to have a robust social network. Now, think about even if your loved one does have a robust social network, are they seeing them? Are they interacting with them? So think about these areas that maybe they have lots of friends. They go to the senior center. They go to dinner with friends and neighbors, and they go to neighborhood barbecues. If that's been limited, and they're not maybe using the phone or Zoom as much, and let's face it, none of those things really take the place of in-person interaction. They're good, 
but they're not taking the place, this could be a problem for somebody. This could increase the risk. But having a robust social network that you keep in touch with is, does mitigate risk. So who is most risky? Who's more likely uh, to be causing you, um, causing you the possibility of you want to be concerned about this person? So who would that person be? So somebody who is financially dependent on the older adult, and a lot of times, absolutely, you all are right, that is the adult child, adult grandchild, uh, a friend, uh, somebody that's unemployed. Again, right now, think about it. During this time, a lot of people are out of work. So your loved one, theoretically, if they have people that are friends, neighbors, new friends, which we'll talk about in a moment, who are unemployed, this is a risk factor for a perpetrator. Of course, we don't mean not everybody who's unemployed is, but we just want to keep in mind. Somebody who exhibits narcissistic traits, risk factor for exploiting. Someone who abuses alcohol. Somebody who has mental illness, any kind of mental illness. It's an increased risk factor that that person might be uh, a, 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 somebody that could be a perpetrator. Somebody that's a brand new friend. So I want to ask anybody and everybody to write in, why do I say a brand new friend? So usually meeting a new friend is a great thing. And we always want to encourage older persons to be social. I know right now is a really weird time. We're not encouraging that. Uh, we're encouraging social distancing for older adults. But uh, most of the time, we're like, go out and meet people. Get, some, get somebody new in your life. So I want to ask for you to write into the chat section what kinds of qualities and, and characteristics might be a red flag for a new friend. So take a couple moments to write in. Okay, we're getting some thoughts in here. Someone that has, there's a big age difference. That's, that's, a, that's a really good one. Now, I will tell you, and I'm sure many of you on this program today say, well, I have friends of all ages, and I, and I personally do. Younger friends, older friends, I have friends of all age groups. So, but, but when you've got someone that's much, much younger, a lot of times that can be a red flag especially if that person presents as a romantic partner. So just something to think about. It doesn't necessarily mean that the person has bad intentions. It doesn't mean anything like that all, all the time, but it's something to watch. So if your loved one is, is you know, the, the person that landscapes their house, they've suddenly become really attached to, they're baking that person cookies all the time, they, they're telling that person their problems, this, I'm not saying that the landscaper is going to take advantage of your loved one, but it's just something to keep an eye on. It's something to be thinking about. Who is less risky? So if somebody in the family or friend network is helping manage money and they are being transparent with others in the family and they're not isolating the older loved one, that person's probably not as risky. So the third part is we want to involve our loved one in prevention. And how can we do that? We want to encourage that person to identify who would be their financial power of attorney if they're incapacitated. When decisions have to be made, especially if there is cognitive impairment, dementia, let's say your loved one has COVID and is not able to answer and make decisions in a moment. We want the person to have somebody that they trust that truly would do what they want with their money. The other issue, so for bank accounts, for all, you know, any kind of money, but for brokerage accounts and financial investments, it's important for that person to consider identifying ahead of time what we call a trusted contact person, which is different from a power of attorney. And this is somebody that if somebody has investments and they're working with a financial professional, that you say, okay, my daughter or my best friend, if I'm if you worried about me, that this is my identified person. So the reason that financial professionals like to have this person on file is because, and FINRA created this rule a few years ago that they're, they're really encouraging financial professionals to get a trusted contact person on the, 
on the uh, the file is because let's say Mrs. Smith, your mom walks in or calls her financial professional and maybe your mom has $500,000 in an IRA and your mom says, you know what, I wanna liquidate that, I'm gonna give it to my landscaper. This doesn't sound like Mrs. Smith. The financial professional is worried. He's been working with Mrs. Smith for 15 years. If there's a trusted contact person on file, the, the financial professional can call and say, hey, I'm worried about your mom, Mrs. Smith. Or, and, and you know, is this legit? Should she, do you think it's appropriate? Does she have any kind of issues? Is there dementia? Is there anything that we could worry about? But up until a few years ago, the financial professional really didn't have any recourse. So if, you're, if your loved one has a financial account with a brokerage account or a, a certified financial professional, really important for them to have a trusted contact person. And again, you want to trust this person. It's not that your financial professional is going to call them for just anything. They're not going to just say, oh, is, is your mom allowed to do this? No, but if it's something out of character, out of the ordinary, where they are concerned. We want to encourage our older loved ones, get them on the do not call list. I know it's not foolproof, but try just keep signing up for the do not call list. Create a 24 hour policy, making major decisions about money, 24 hour policy. And if my grandmother, thankfully we were able to get my grandma out of that product, but if we were unable to get my grandmother out of that product, that 20, if she had the 24 hour policy, like, okay, I, I like this product. I'm going to talk about it with my family or I'm going to sleep on it. That can avoid a lot of problems. So helping the person create a 24 hour policy, being careful who you hire. So a few years ago, uh, there's a reporter that I am actually a source for pretty frequently. Her name is Deb Hip, and you should read her article. She's a great writer, but she was doing this article that got picked up by Forbes and she was writing a story about her mom and her mom was uh, a widow and her mom completely had capacity, was totally able to make decisions for herself. But after her husband died, she decided, her Deb's mom, and I'll call her, her mom, Mary, Mary decided that she wanted somebody to help her with some tasks around the house and errands. And so Deb and her brother lived a couple hours away. And so Mom, Mary decides to hire, I'm gonna call her Lucy. She decides to hire somebody named Lucy. Well, where did she find Lucy? She actually is one of those older adults that's very, very good with technology, very ahead of most, many older adults. And she had placed an, an ad on Craigslist. And Craigslist, uh, this person, Lucy responded to the Craigslist list uh, offering. And Deb's mom, Mary, likes her. She hires her. She brings her in. And things are going fine. They bond. They become really friendly. But suddenly, Mary starts to give Lucy money. Lucy's behind on her rent. Lucy's kids need shoes. And it becomes a really challenging situation because Deb is hearing about Lucy and she's a little bit curious. She's wondering, is this person okay? But Mary thinks that she's amazing. And then one day Deb receives a phone call from Mary and she is tells Mary she's missing all kinds of really important, really sentimental jewelry. And of course, Deb immediately thinks, could it be this Mary? Could it be this Mary? Oh, sorry, Lucy that stole all the jewelry. And Ultimately, what wound up happening is Lucy said that she didn't steal the jewelry, but that she knew where Mary could buy it back. So she knew who took it. Ultimately, eventually, Lucy admitted that she took the jewelry. And unfortunately, though, they, Lucy was never prosecuted for this crime. Why do you suppose that is? If anybody has any thoughts on why Lucy wasn't reported to the police, uh, they wound up doing a full background check. Uh, Deb and her family did a background check on this Lucy person, and they found out that she had done this to many other people. But Mary absolutely refused to, tell the, to cooperate with the police, to talk to the police. Why do you suppose that might be? Well, number one, you know, if anybody has any thoughts or comments, or feel free to write in, but Keep in mind that 
Mary bonded with Lucy. They became friends. She started to really care about Lucy. And she felt bad for her. She, Lucy had a hard life. She's got a harder life than I do. But also, after reading all of the crimes that Lucy had been uh, convicted of, Mary was scared of her. What if she's involved with unsavory people that could cause harm to me? So it, it, it's really tough. The other part that Mary struggled with is I don't want people questioning my capacity. I made a stupid decision. I made a bad mistake. I didn't, I should have gone to a home care agency and hired someone that was vetted or I should have vetted this person better. And she felt silly. She felt foolish. And I got to tell you that same sentiment happened to my grandma when my grandma was, when she had that product, she was so walked out of that bank and called everybody was so proud of herself for trying to fix some of the financial issues that she was having. And she was embarrassed that it didn't work out, that she had caused more of a problem. And so Mary was really reluctant to talk about this, but these are the types of things that happen. And again, during this pandemic, when we're asking people to stay away from each other, they're not out and about, they're not in their usual routine, people are more at risk. Isolation and loneliness. So isolation is when you're actually not engaging with others. So it's a subjective measure. So if you don't talk to people on the phone, you're not Zooming with others, you're not visiting with family and friends, going to cookouts, you can objectively, someone can say you're isolated. Loneliness, on the other hand, is a self-report. It's subjective. So I feel lonely or I don't feel lonely. If your loved one is feeling lonely and you can objectively say they're pretty isolated, the odds of them, first of all, there's a lot of negative issues that are happening, which is one of the reasons I think we as a country have to really be thinking about these lockdowns and social distancing and weighing the mental health and the physical health issues that are aside from COVID because when somebody is, physic uh, is socially isolated and or lonely, they are more at risk for stroke. They are more at risk for heart attack. They are more at risk for dementia. They are more at risk for accidents. And in addition, they're more at risk to be abused, neglected, and financially exploited. So keep in mind, if your loved one falls into that category that you can say subjectively, that if she, he or she says, I feel lonely, I'm not connecting with others, or you feel like you're observing symptoms of loneliness, or you're saying, you know what, they're not, maybe you decided, you all are like this, she needs to social distance, she's very high risk for COVID, we get that, but what is she doing? Is she doing Zoom calls with family and friends? Is she staying in touch with family and friends on the computer phone calls? Are you doing window visits or outdoor visits or taking walks together six feet apart? What are you doing to mitigate that loneliness? Because this is a, a loneliness and isolation contribute to financial exploitation every day. But because we're dealing with so much loneliness and isolation right now, it's really important to keep your eye on it if you're worried about a loved one. So be careful who you hire. Um, this is not foolproof, but if you want to check a financial professional that your loved one is working with or considering working with, you can look for red flags here. Um, uh, don't get your bi bias. Don't let your biases get in the way. Uh, for example, just because you're maybe your uh, loved one lives in a house like this and they have a PhD or an MD or a JD, it doesn't mean that they wouldn't potentially fall for a scam. Anybody can fall for a scam. You can have a bad day. Um, more resources. Um, Adult Protective Services. You can always call Adult Protective Services, and NAPSA is the National Adult Protective Services Association. You can always make that call, and you can make that anonymously if you're worried about somebody that's interfering with your loved one's life, or you think that this new friend is maybe not on the up and up. Um, the resources from FINRA, um, that this is a uh, this is some information about the rules about the trusted contact person. And there also is a senior helpline at FINRA, again, for issues involving IRAs and brokerage accounts and, and that sort of thing. 
Um, the National Center on Elder Abuse is a great resource for more information. If your loved one needs someone to manage money and you don't have the energy or time or you don't want to do it or for whatever reason you and your family want an objective person to write checks, to pay bills, the American Association of Daily Money Management is a great resource. When hiring a home care aide or someone to help out at home, I remember when my grandmother needed home care and I remember my one of my aunts had said, well, they have a friend who it works as a nursing assistant in a nursing home and she would love to pick up some extra hours. And I cautioned against that, not because I didn't like the friend. I actually knew the friend and I thought she'd be a good candidate. But for one, you never know. You never know, unless you're gonna run a background check, unless you're gonna vet that person. And But think about just finding someone on Craigslist is not a great plan. If you find a friend or somebody by word of mouth, it can maybe work out sometimes, but I think it can be a really good idea to go find somebody who is licensed, who's gonna be overseen by an agency, um, that, it, you know, if you're gonna bring help in. And the, one of the reasons for this is there's going, for right now in particular, COVID, you know, what are they doing to try to keep your loved one safe? The other issue that we see with AIDS is that there's supervision, that typically a nurse is responsible for the home care AIDS. They're gonna check in with you and your loved one to see if it's going well. Um, and you know, obviously, if your loved one is in senior living or going to senior living, this is also sometimes you do need to bring an aid into senior living. You want to vet that person and make sure that they're going to be the least risk. Now, can someone at a home care association, sorry, um, that you hire through a, a franchise or an agency, could they take advantage of your loved one? Sure, but there's just more measures in place. There's more safeguards that are gonna reduce the risk. In senior living or nursing home, people often will say, oh my goodness, I don't know if I ever want my mom to move because of exploitation and abuse. More abuse, neglect, and exploitation happens in the private home by people that that person knows than ever happens in nursing home assisted living. It's just that we read the headlines and we see those news stories more but your loved one is more likely to be uh, at risk for abuse, neglect, exploitation living in the community. But if there ever is an issue in senior living or nursing home, go to the ombudsman. 911 is always a resource. I know that Deb's mom, Mary, didn't want to use 911, but no, it's always a resource for you. Document. If you're concerned about somebody or some organization that your loved one is involved with, take your own notes and present that evidence to your loved one, what you've observed, don't make it an emotional conversation. And again, more than ever, if your mom gives you an example of, oh, I got this call from a credit card company, or I got this call from somebody that wants to fix my computer over the phone, you know, have that conversation with your loved one and document. And if your loved one is getting scammed regularly, Having this documentation can help you to see a pattern if they're writing, constantly writing checks to charities. Now, a lot of well-meaning charities who are legit charities will sometimes send uh, requests for donations that look like invoices. That's something to keep an eye out on as well. Don't make decisions in a vacuum. If it's just you and your loved one, it, it's probably a good idea to work with a care manager or work with a a case manager or work with other members of the family to try to determine if, if there's an issue. But when in doubt, you can always call Adult Protective Services. And during this time of, even many of us are, are, are socially isolated and lonely because maybe we're not going out and about as much as we once did or at all. Um, you, you don't want to get too much in your own head. You want to confer with others. You can always work with uh, care managers, elder law attorney, but calling adult protective services and just getting a consult is always an option as well. So here are some COVID specific resources and I'm actually going to take them out and I'm going to pull them out and put them into the chat section directly for you. So you have these COVID specific resources. You can cut and paste if you would like. Um, and I uh, want to say thank you all so much 
I'm going to sorry, pull that back up for just a moment. I'm going to put that COVID specific um, resources back on the screen uh, in the chat section, actually. Sorry about that. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, give you the, write that in the chat section so you have it if you would like to cut and paste. And I want to say thank you all so much. I know this is a very, very difficult time for everybody. A lot of times we don't know what the right thing to do is, how to keep our loved one safe. But one thing I will leave you with is we want to just make sure your loved one is engaged in some way, whether they're at senior living. Um, it's, not, it's not the same as it was in February right now. They've had to make some adaptations because of COVID. Hopefully that will continue to get, get more and more uh, back to normal. But we want to do everything that we can to uh, to try to reduce isolation and loneliness for your loved one during this challenging time because it is a major contributor to exploitation. Feel free to write in any comments or questions in the chat section. And in the meantime, I'm going to turn it back over to the team at Brightby Senior Living who um, support, uh, provided financial support and sponsorship for this program today. Thank you all so much. And Stephanie's going to put a link in for the um the evaluation if you would be kind enough to fill that out it only takes about two to three minutes if you would cut and paste that thank you all so much and i hope you have a great rest of the day we're going to keep that chat section in case you have any last questions heather hi thank you so much jennifer for presenting today and for stephanie for being here as well please reach out to us if there's anything that we can do for you if you're not sure about something we could always refer you to someone else who may be able to help you if we're not able to um, and I can send out another email to everyone who's attended with some of our contact information. We really appreciate everybody taking the time out today, and we hope that you have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heather. And thanks to all of our Montgomery County Brightview Senior Living Communities for sponsoring this really important um, program and topic. And thanks to Jennifer for the great information provided as well. We really appreciate everybody um, tuning in and joining us. And I did put a link for the Survey Monkey. So if you don't mind just taking a couple of minutes, you can cut and paste that into your browser and fill it out and tell us, give us some feedback on our program today. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks to Brightview Senior Living in Montgomery County. And I hope everybody has a safe and wonderful day.